Hi everybody, this is Ben Douglas from St. James School. Um, I'd like to thank you all for uh, joining us today. Andrew and I had the uh, real pleasure and privilege of giving this talk at the, the annual meeting in September and uh, are, are thrilled to be sharing again with everybody. Um, my name is again Ben Douglas, Director of Admission at St. James School. Um, a little bit about myself, uh, just to give some context to what we'll be talking about today. Um, I've been in the boarding school world for um, you know, 14 or 15 years at this point, um, I guess 14 years. Um, I started in the, on the academic side of things for the first seven years as a teacher and academic administrator at a boarding school in California. Um, I then moved my family uh, back to the East Coast to Blue Ridge School in Virginia and spent the next five years as the assistant and then associate director of admission there. Um, two years ago, I have moved north to Western Maryland to St. James School and am now about halfway through my second year as the director of admission uh, there at St. James. Um, St. James is a small Episcopal co-ed boarding and day school uh, in Hagerstown, Maryland. Andrew? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andrew Weller. I'm the Dean of Admissions at Ridley College in Ontario, right next to Niagara Falls. Um, Ridley is the largest boarding program um, in Ontario. We have over 300 boarders. They come from 41 different countries this year. Um, I've been in admissions. This is my 23rd year of doing admissions. I've done it at the college level, the boarding school level, day school. I've done Catholic, Anglican, independent, single sex, uh, co-ed, um, and have had a, had a long career in this wonderful profession that we all enjoy. This presentation that Ben and I gave back at the annual meeting in September um, came from a conversation he and I were part of um, at another meeting uh, uh, two summers ago where we were talking to some, some of our colleagues that were about to be new directors and they were asking questions trying to get prepared to start in September in their new role um, and we found the questions were a little surprising. Uh, we didn't think they were quite asking the right questions. Um, that, a, that a new director should ask. And so that was kind of the, the genesis of this idea that we put together to try to help people who haven't been a director before um, start to reconfigure their thinking and their perspective um, as they go into the new school year in their first year as a director. Over to you, Ben. All right, thanks. So um, the one of the main issues that a new director faces is the transition from a, an associate director or an assistant director and one of the worker bees that's doing the, the real uh, good and important work of admissions to the queen bee uh, who's leading it. And so it's that change in responsibility and, and having a different primary role that really throws a lot of people for a loop. Um, even as a director of admission and as a Queen B, you still might have to do some of the work of admissions. You're still doing some interviews. Um, you're still, you know, attending some school fairs and, and meeting and greeting families and things like that. Of course, um, a lot of that will depend on the size of office that you, that you work in. Um, my office uh, has three three people plus an office manager, admin assistant. Uh, so we're, we're relatively small, and so I'm still doing some of the work of admissions. Um, but it's a matter of what your primary role is. And so as the director, you know, my primary role is to deliver uh, a high quality incoming class of students um, that meets the educational and artistic and athletic and, um, you know, at the end of the day, financial needs of uh, St. James School. And you can't really do that without being purposeful and intentional and in leading the team, uh, thinking strategically and working with the leadership team on some of the uh, larger school issues that are out there. Um, and one of the things that I've really had to avoid, and I think it's a um, very common thing, um, is I've had to really be mindful about not regressing to what's comfortable for me. Um, what's comfortable for me is, uh, you know, even a year and a half into it, is still being an associate director of admission or even a teacher and coach. Um, and so, I've really had to be mindful of not regressing to what's comfortable. Um, you know, there, there's a book called The First 90 Days, and uh, it, it really speaks about that. And um, something that I've taken from that is I've actually sought out the uncomfortable aspects of the director's job 
and uh, really try to tackle them head on. And wh whether those are uh, tough admissions phone calls and decisions that, that we've had to make, um, tough financial aid discussions with uh, with returning families, uh, even you know actually you know calling some some folks and, and doing some uh, some baby fundraising. Uh, that, that's definitely not immediately in my wheelhouse. And so it's something that in this first year and a half, I've really tried to uh, go out and do uh, right away. Um, one of the other difficult things for a lot of folks as they transition to the director role is to uh, delegate to other people. Uh, you can't really be a queen bee uh, without giving some of the jobs that you used to do uh, to the team that, that you're leading now. Um, and I've really kind of seen delegation coming into in as uh, four parts. Uh, the first part is letting go and coming to grips uh, that the people that you're delegating to are going to do the task differently than you would have done. Um, and that's okay. You know, that, that's, they're allowed to put their own flavor on it and they don't have to be little uh, Ben Douglas or Andrew Weller drones that uh, do things the exact same way that we would. Um, it is important though that you set and communicate expectations. Um, you know, it still has to meet your standards even if it doesn't uh, if, even if it isn't done the way that you would have done it. Uh, because at the end of the day, uh, you're still going to be judged by the work that's done by your team. Um, the third phase of delegation is trusting. Uh, you really, you've hired a competent team or you've inherited a competent team and you need to uh, trust them to do the job well. Uh, you don't really save any time and uh, take anything off of your plate if you're micromanaging every detail. Uh, and then lastly, um, and this is, I have a story about this last one, and that's uh, to verify, verification. Uh, don't assume anything. You, you need to check in with your team frequently and check the progress that's being made on the project. Um, and at the end of last year, I, I, uh, I made this mistake. This is one of those rookie mistakes. I, um, every, every year, um, even at Blue Ridge, but it's something that St. James has done too, is we have a new student PowerPoint uh, that we present at the, uh, the very last teacher meeting of, of the school year. And um, in doing that, I, I delegated that PowerPoint to uh, one of my associate directors and said, you know, this is exactly how we want it. And we talked about a slightly different way to, to organize it and everything seemed great. Uh, he's a very, very competent guy and he does great work and he's very tech savvy. Um, I would check in with them periodically and say, how's it going? And he'd say, great, everything's good. Um, but when he handed me the memory stick and I plugged it into my computer to present in front of everybody, somehow he had saved a, an old copy where everything was jumbled and we had uh, you know, Korean senior pictures uh, listed as a uh, new ninth grader from Washington, D.C. and it, it, was a, it was a huge, huge mess. Um, and I was, Andrew and I were talking earlier today and I'm literally still taking flack about that one PowerPoint presentation. So um, needless to say, we revamped the PowerPoint and actually even did a Prezi. I didn't want to have this uh, associated with a PowerPoint anymore. And uh, we, we did a new Prezi that was updated and uh, nice and snazzy and um, presented that to the teachers at the first meeting of the school year. Um, so hopefully uh, repaired some of the damage that was done. And then lastly, uh, as the, uh, you're transitioning, um, you need to transition your overall thought press, uh, process to, um, to one of institutional leadership um, you're, you're really working with a new focus. Um, you know, that focus is on the entire school and it's functioning and not just the job that you're doing there in admissions. Great. As you make this transition from uh, worker bee to queen bee, um, you need to start to think about the different roles that you're going to have. And there's a couple teams with which you're going to be affiliated with. Um, and the first team is your school's leadership team or your administrative team or executive team, whatever it may be. Um, that's your first team, and that's a team where you're, you're a player. You've got peers on that team. These are your colleagues. Um, this is not your office. These are the people that uh, you can have frank and honest conversations with. They're the people you can commiserate with. Um, this is your peer group. They've got your back, and, and you need to have their back. Um, and you need to think about what it means to be a player on this team in terms of your equality with your fellow colleagues. Um, 
you're, it's not appropriate for you to be complaining about something at school to the people that work for you who are your subordinates. This is the group that you can commiserate with, and this is a group that you can float ideas by and have honest conversations and give honest feedback to. Um, these, these are your guys, and, and you're their guy, and the head of this team um, is your head of school or your, or your headmaster. Um, so this, this is a team in which you are actually a player and an equal and a peer among the rest of the people on the team. And then the, the other role that you'll play as the admission director um, is that of the coach, and, and you are the coach of the admissions, the admissions team. Uh, again, you're the queen bee, uh, you're the tip of the spear, the admissions spear there, um, you're the grand poobah of the office. Um, and you know, with that in mind, you have a certain set of roles that are very different from your roles as a member of the administrative team. Um, so as a coach, you're um, empowering your, your players and your team to achieve their best. You're, you're developing a strategy. Uh, you're understanding um, the big picture and the larger picture and how things are, are interconnected and, and working in different ways. Um, you're also teaching your team um, and being a good mentor. And uh, you're in charge of quality control. You're ma making sure that your team is producing a good product. Um, so those are all really important things to keep in mind as you're, as you're going through um, your role as the uh, Grand Poobah of the admissions office. Um, as that Grand Poobah, you're also really the face of the franchise, and, and I mean that in a couple of different ways. Um, first, you're, you're presenting your school to a lot of different people and for the very first time. Um, but in addition to that, you're, you're also uh, being looked up at uh, by other, other folks that are around. People are watching you uh, to see how you dress and how you act, um, the, the things that you say, making sure that you get the culture. Um, and you know, the headmaster's watching you, other administrators are watching, the board of trustees has your, their eye on you. Um, you know, you're, you're representing the ideal of the school and kind of trying to be the perfect embodiment um, of the community and the, and the spirit that exists within it. Um, and so everything that you do uh, can really impact that. And um, you know, it's, it, it's a matter of, you know, e even your attendance at certain things and certain events will shift from, you know, when, when you're an associate director um, and you show up at the school play, um, the, the drama, teacher or the uh, fine arts director will look and be like, oh, how nice that Ben showed up. Uh, that's you know, kind and thoughtful of him. To, whereas the director of admission, if you don't show up, it, it'll be, okay, where is he? He needs to be here. Yes. And so your absences are noted, uh, your attendances are watched. Um, and for me, one, one of the big things here at St. James that I've really had to work on is um, you know, my attendance in chapel. Um, it's something that I'm very mindful about. Um, you know, it, it's easy to have uh, you know Skypes with students from Asia uh, at, at that eight o'clock hour. It's easy to come in and get caught up in uh, emails or uh, file reviews or things like that. Um, but it's uh, a really important part of our community to start every day with with a chapel service, and um, it's something that I make sure that I'm at every day that I'm here on campus because um, you know I sit next to a first year teacher. Um, in our pew, and I know that she notices when I'm not there. Um, and so I, I want to make sure that I'm showing up, that I, you know, I have my coat and tie on, I have a fresh shave or a rel relatively fresh shave, and that uh, you know, I'm portraying that image of the school um, that we're supposed to be portraying. Excellent. Um, thanks, Ben. It makes me feel good that I went to chapel this morning. <laughs> um, I was there too, I was there too. <laughs> um, one of the things that's really important and can be a challenge for new directors is to remember that you have to focus on the things that only you can do. Um, we're all, I imagine, we're all in this because, you know, how much we love working with kids and how much we like trying to make a difference and working with families and helping them figure out if this is the right match. But if you're spending all day talking to kids and interviewing them and working with tour guides, then you're a very, very well-paid admissions counselor. 
um, and you're not doing the role of the admissions director. And the admissions director has to do the things that only they can do um, and leave the other things to those people who are on their staff. So as Ben was talking about a couple minutes ago, you know, the importance of being the coach of your team. Um, you're not the chief uh, kind of colleague. You're, you're the leader of this team, and you need to manage this team. Um, as an admissions dean, I probably spend somewhere between, I don't know, 15 and 25% of my time in a week um, doing team management and personnel-related things, uh, whether it's something as small as someone wants to take some vacation time um, to someone who's thinking about going back to graduate school and wants to know how that might be able to, you know, fit within the confines of their job. Um, the long number of hours I take doing performance reviews every year. Um, these are only things that I can do uh, as the leader of the team and as this director. Um, it's also my role to, to mentor my group. Um, you know, no one grows up wanting to work in admissions. Uh, there's little to no uh, formal training for this. So it's up to us as directors um, to try to be mentors to the people on our team, to look for professional development opportunities for them. Um, and this is where I'll put in my shameless plug for the uh, SSAT annual meeting. I've only missed one in 17 years. Um, it's the only thing you can do uh, that you know every single keynote speaker and every single session is going to be about admissions. Um, everything that they do at the annual meeting each year is all and entirely about admissions. Um, and these are things that we need to be doing as leaders of our offices. We need to be looking for the opportunities to help people in our office grow. For new people to learn the business and the practice, to help our middle management people get ready to be directors of their own somewhere at some point. Um, that's a key function of the director. And if you're not doing that, if you're spending your time um, doing other things that other people can, uh, your staff can be doing, then you're not doing a good job of only doing what it is the director can do. And one of the other things that only the director can do and should be, again, a big focus of your time is money management. Um, you are in charge of the budget. You are in charge of allocating the resources that have been given to you by your CFO or your board or your head. Um, you need to be sitting down and making the decisions. You know, Where are we going to spend our marketing dollars? If you're a boarding school, where are we going to uh, spend our traveling dollars? Um, you know, what, what kind of money are we going to spend on our tour guides to train them or celebrate them or appreciate them? Um, and you need to be thinking about, what am I going to get back for that? You know, it's very difficult to say, gosh, if I spend $10,000 on this particular advertisement that, you know, I should be able to get three kids out of it. It's not that easy. But you need to at least be thinking about, why am I spending this money? We all have budgets. We all have limits. Um, and so we all have to make choices. And one of the important roles of the director of admission is to make those choices, make informed choices about how you're going to spend the money that you've been giving to meet the goals that you're trying to meet at the end of the year. And these are only things that the director can do, and they're the things that the director is accountable for. So if you're not focusing on what the director can do, that means it's either not getting done or someone else is doing it, but those are the things that you're held responsible for at the end of the year. So it's important that you take ownership of them. Um, as Ben said, it's easy to, to slip back into the things that we really like doing. We love talking to kids and interviewing kids and talking to parents and being excited about our school, but those aren't the things that we're being paid to do any longer when we move into the top role within our office. You also will have the, oh, I'm here, uh, the administrative tasks that only a director can really do. Um, for the administrative team, the director of admissions is really the, the only person that has their, their boots on the ground in, in terms of um, getting out into the boarding school or, or independent school world and really seeing what's, what's going on out there. Um, you know, as we're hanging out together at uh, at school fairs and you know visiting consultants and we're on the road and we're traveling to um, you know, Asia or Turkey or Africa or wherever wherever it is that we go and, and go together um, you know we're sharing and it's one of my favorite things about the um, admissions world is how open and sharing we are um, kind of going off track just a little bit but with the um, uh, personal development and personnel development. Um, I sent my new associate to 
the um, Admissions Training Institute at SSATB's annual meeting. And um, he's brand new to admissions, but he's been um, in the kind of the boarding and independent school game for a while, and he's, he's a coach, and so he understands talking to families and recruiting and, and everything like that. But he came to me and he was like, uh, Ben, it's, it's amazing how open and honest people are with each other. It's like I, I can't imagine sharing you know, my recruiting secrets with a rival coach. And we're all competing for the same kids, but we're all at the same time being so open and honest and helping each other. And uh, it's true, it's, it's a remarkable uh, thing. And so with that sharing that we all do when we're all together, um, we take a lot of valuable information um, back to the administrative team and back uh, even to the um, board of trustees. Um, and so it, it's important for us to be that voice in those uh, administrative team meetings of you know saying, well, you know, yeah, it sounds great. You know, adding a new language would be perfect, and it's something that's important. But I'm not sure if Romanian is the the best choice. You know, a lot of schools are adding Mandarin and uh, maybe even some Portuguese and stuff like that. So, um, you know, maybe we want to, you know, kind of steer things that way or, or at least be cognizant of what we're doing and kind of the, the niche we're placing ourselves in by choosing Romanian. Um, so, so being that voice uh, is pretty important. Um, the other issue that, that we can do as, as an administrator, as a director of admissions, uh, is in the area of governance. Um, you know, we can really be a valuable tool that the headmaster and that the board of trustees can use when making school-wide and strategic decisions for the school. Um, and that's everything from you know, setting tuition to um, decisions about the physical plant, uh, the maintenance, uh, you know, some discipline issues, development of new programs, and how all of these will be seen through the um, the lens of the of the public view and um, how the public will will see what those uh, changes will will be and what it means for the school. Um, so it's uh, a pretty another pretty important role that we that we have as administrators within the administrative team. And then lastly, um, probably one of my personal least favorites, just because it's so uh, non admissions and has very little to do with my actual uh, focus and goals, but those are the some school-wide operation stuff. Um, so th these are more of the larger uh, leader team or administrative team issues that come up. Um, you know, things like lockdown drills and procedures, and making sure that the you know the fire drill the kids were five minutes too slow or or whatever, and um, you know, developing the school calendar and you know how the summer programs are all going to mesh together, things like that, personnel issues, um, policy changes, all of those things. Um, so the, the admissions office really can bring uh, a lot of insight to how those things will play out and uh, how things can uh, be spun by prospective families and, and by other schools. Uh, so that voice in the uh, board, of trust, board of Trustees meeting or the uh, administrative team meetings is an important one to have. All right. This is an, an, another new thing for new directors, and that's the uh, the need to work at thirty thousand feet. Um, I certainly felt like for the five years that I was an assistant and associate director. Um, that I was doing more crop dusting than I was uh, soaring at 30,000 feet. Um, you know, you were dealing with the, the real day-to-day -day issues, maybe even the minute-to-minute -minute or hour-by-hour -hour issues of uh, you know running new families around and making sure they have all of their forms and um, uh, finding tour guides and, and, and all, all the little day-to-day -day things. But as a director, it's really, really important to make sure that you get yourself up to 30,000 feet at a very regular basis. Um, the amount of time that you can spend at 30,000 feet, um, I think, really depends on how big your office is and, and how well your office is working for you. Um, you know, I, I 
can't stay at 30,000 feet for too awfully long at, the, at this point here at St. James, uh, mainly because of office size. My staff's really good for me. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I certainly make it a point to get, get up there and uh, really start looking at my uh, strategic work management, how, how I'm managing my day. Um, one of the things that I have to constantly remind myself um, is that I'm not a superhero. Um, it's not because, uh, you know, I, I don't want to, I certainly want to be a superhero. I want to do it all. I want to uh, be able to be at 30,000 feet and crop dust at the same time. Um, but the reality is, is that you can't do it. Uh, and if you are doing it, you can't do it for very long before you burn out um, and, and really start disliking your job and your school. Um, so you, you really have to make sure that you uh, are, again, delegating tasks um, and, and really when you're delegating, letting go um, and, and, and letting folks really run uh, with those projects themselves as you trust but verify. Um, and then once you're doing the work that you're doing, you have to really be cognizant of uh, prioritizing that work. And uh, you know, I, I think we're all victims of email, and uh, it's it's so hard not to be a, a slave to the uh, to the Bing that as that comes in that you want to be, you know, of course, a good customer service representative, and you want to you know jump on that email right away and answer the question in an amazingly thoughtful uh, way that's going to, you know, maybe bring that student into the school. Um, but the reality is, is that email is such a distraction that it's, you know, impossible to focus on some of the larger and more important tasks. Um, I've read uh, a couple of books that have dealt with this in the, uh, in the last couple of years. Um, one is The Four-Hour Workweek, uh, which is a, a pretty interesting book. and. Uh, something that I'm not necessarily aspiring to have. I think that'd be impossible at a boarding school, obviously. Um, but uh, the author is, I believe, Tim Ferriss. And um, basically, he has weaned himself and his employees and his customers off of email and communicating with him by email to the point where he has an uh, out-of-office reply that says, I check my email on Tuesday afternoons from 2 to 4 p.m., I'll, I'll get back to you then. Uh, for any other essential uh, things between now and then, please contact so-and-so. You know, so he basically just delegates everything then to a second person other than the most vital, non-time sensitive issues. Um, so a pretty interesting uh, pr way of doing it there. He also does a lot of work with, um, you know, prioritizing what's important to him and, and really doing what, yeah, he's a CEO, so really doing what, having the CEO only doing what the CEO can do. Um, and so he delegates a lot and actually even uses virtual assistants uh, that are overseas and I think mainly in India are the ones that he uses. Um, there's a, a, another uh, article or book called Never Check Email in the Morning and it's certainly something that I've found as I've done my very best to implement this is you know, th the first things that you do in the morning need to be very productive. Um, it tends to be, at least here at St. James, the quietest part of my day uh, where I can really uh, have a good sustained hour or so without the phone ringing or um, you know, students to, to interview or whatever. So um, I, I do my very best to not check email in the morning. Um, I'll may, maybe give it a quick scan right before chapel to see if there are any time sensitive things that I really need to jump on. But other than that, you know, I, I save my um, my less important emails and responses for times where I'm likely to be interrupted, and so I, I don't have to have that sustained focus for a long period of time. Um, you know, something else with uh, strategic work management is uh, really focusing on what's important in admissions, and that's enrollment management, um, and really thinking stri strategically about that, um, really looking at the big picture, uh, making good projections that are uh, data-driven and fact-based, um, because you have to really create uh, reasonable but challenging goals uh, for you and your team to make, um, because you're not going to really get anywhere if you just kind of let it happen and, and you don't know where you're going. Um, so one of the uh, import, most important things that I first did when I got to St. James was to really sit down and look at some of the historical data that I could dig out of the database and um, 
you know, use that with you know, confidence in myself and my team to make some projections. Um, and, and honestly, uh, you know, not to pat myself on the back too much, but uh, so far so good. We, we've hit our projection last year and we're uh, certainly on track for this year too. So um, it's important to, to do that. Um, and it, it's with that strategic management too, it's also important to understand your position within the marketplace, how you relate to the other schools around you, um, and that's going to drive how you brand your school, how you market your school, and how you advertise your school. Um, it's an important job. You know, this is a, you know, admissions is a job that really requires um, a global perspective and understanding. Uh, we need to know about all of our markets, both uh, domestic and international. And we need to know how to differentiate and segment our approaches in those different areas. Um, so your, your branding and your marketing initiatives in, uh, in Maryland are going to be quite different than what you would do in California and certainly different than what you would do in, uh, say, Ghana or Turkey. Um, so you, you really need to know uh, how what you do is going to have an, an, an impact uh, on your numbers. Um, you also need to know how to communicate those differences to the rest of the admissions team so they know what they're doing and you're also educating them too and, and, and developing their craft. You need to be able to describe what you're doing to your administrative team uh, so, they, so they understand these uh, more global initiatives. And then also to the school community. Um, you know, it, it's really important that the, uh, the school community be on board and understand you know, uh, why the director of admission is uh, you know, flying to China to uh, recruit students when it seems like there are a lot of Chinese students already. Um, and there are a lot of very important reasons to do so. Um, you know, admissions is also a really important job. Um, you know, working at, you know, looking at 30,000 feet and looking at that big picture uh, because we're playing uh, a really a, a very large role in the uh, development and the creation of 21st century education. Um, we're kind of acting as the, uh, you know, I guess kind of in this sense, the worker bees and we're bringing lots of ideas from a variety of different places uh, to the administrative table uh, for the team to consider. That's going to lead to, you know, policy changes and um, our input on, on, on those changes and how they will be, how they'll have an effect both internally within the community and also externally in the uh, in the prospective student pool, um, you know, is, is going to really determine how best we, we can provide these new best practices. Um, so it, it's it's important. You know, we're we're helping to incorporate new technology in the classroom uh, based on conversations that we have, based on school visits that we do. Um, not that this is really educational technology, but one of the things that uh, happened recently at St. James is that um, we we allowed cell phones here for the first time. Uh, for decades, this was, well, I guess maybe not decades because they haven't been around that long, but you know, for, I say, a decade, this was a cell phone free campus. And um, finally, the clamoring from the parents and from the students and, uh, you know, the admissions office noting, noticing how students would kind of turn off when we would answer that question, um, you know, cell phones were allowed. And uh, we were a part of that conversation and, and changing that policy. Um, but we were also a part of the conversation in making sure that that change in policy didn't change the nature of the school. You know, and so at St. James, our cell phones have to stay in the students' dorm rooms. And uh, you know, we don't want students walking around texting each other or uh, you know, just listening to music on their phones. We want them engaged with the community and looking each other in the eye as they pass each other uh, across campus and uh, you know, saying hi to each other and hanging out and being uh, a real community. So um, all very important things uh, as, as you're considering uh, kind of, you know, bumping up from the crop dusting and, and getting up to 30,000 feet. Uh, there are a lot of very important things that we do as admissions directors. Um, moving on from there, um, one of the important things that you have to do as an admissions director is to focus on managing up. Uh, ben and I have talked a lot about the importance of managing down, managing your team, mentoring your team, um, managing their workload. Um, but you also have to manage up. Um, and as a director, you need to think about what is this new relationship with, with, with your headmaster. And you need to first start and not think about them as your headmaster. You need to think about them as your supervisor. 
they're the person who's supposed to mentor you, encourage you, challenge you. They just happen to be the headmaster or the head of school, but they're your direct report, your direct supervisor. And what is that relationship going to look like? What is it that you need from them? What do they need from you? You should have this conversation when you step into this new role. Um, how often are you going to meet with your supervisor? What is there going to be agendas? Are there going to be no agenda? Are there going to be minutes? Are there going to be no minutes? Um, what are you trying to accomplish in these meetings? Are you trying to give things to your supervisor um, that you want them to deal with or you want input from? Or are you trying to take things off their desk? What can you do to make their life a little bit easier? How can you be a valuable resource to them? So you've got to figure out how to manage uh, with, your, with your head of school or your headmaster. You also need to do the same thing with your board. You need to become the credible voice of our profession at your board. They need to look at you and they need to see you as someone that they can believe in, have confidence in, feel as though the admissions office is in, in good hands with you. Um, when you present to the board, you want to make sure that when you walk out the door um, that they feel good about where the office is going and who's leading it. And it's important in managing board expectations and managing your relationship with the board to do that in conjunction with your head. Um, before every board presentation, before I even start to put the PowerPoint together, I always meet with my head and say, okay, what are the goals for this um, presentation? What is it that we want to have happen? What do we want them to, what do I want to leave them with when I walk out the door at the end of my presentation? Um, what does he want me to convey? What things don't we want to convey? What don't we feel is important for the board to know or at least to not know it at, at that time? So managing your board, you want to have a strong partnership with your head of school. You want to, as Stephen Covey says, start with the end in mind. What is it that you want to have accomplished when it's all over with? And then how do you back into that? And then you're also managing in your community, and you're managing your school's reputation and your brand in your community, whether that's uh, with the local chamber of commerce, a business association, the Rotary, um, you know, large uh, um, uh, places of worship in your community, large churches, synagogues, temples. Uh, maybe you have the opportunity to um, do some volunteer work with Stepping Stones or Prep for Prep or those types of access organizations. Uh, maybe you're even invited to sit on the board of a, of a local uh, preschool or a K-6 to school or something like that. Um, so how are you managing your school's brand and reputation out in, the, out in the community? So there's a lot in the director's role about managing down, but there's also actually a lot in the director's role about managing up. And you've got to figure out what those relationships are going to look like. And you need to be overt about it. You need to have those conversations, uh, particularly with your head of school, in the role as your supervisor. You know, how are they going to support you? What can they do to help you professionally in your professional development? Um, how can they challenge you? What's that relationship going to look like between the two of you? Um, there's two ways to become a director of admissions. Uh, one is to be promoted from within, um, and the other is to get the job and come in from the outside. And there's hazards involved in both of those. Um, in the internal promotion, um, we t I talked a little bit earlier about kind of your team affiliation. So you're leaving the admissions team and you're joining the administrative team. And that's a mindset that you have to wrap your head around, as I talked about before. Your administrative colleagues, those are your peers. That's the team you're on. The guys that you used to go out to with drinks on Friday afternoon, that's now the team that you're leading. They're not your peers. They now work for you. Um, so when you're internally promoted, you have to renegotiate kind of where, where you sit on each of those teams. Um, you also need to work on your administrative skills. A great, wonderful associate director of admissions doesn't necessarily make um, for a wonderful director of admissions when you're looking at the administrative work. We talked earlier about doing the things only the director can do. Well, if you've been the associate director all this time, those are things that the director has been doing that you haven't done. Do you know as a first-time director of admissions how to do a, a personnel uh, review? Do you know how to set goals for individuals on your team? Do you know how to manage a budget? Do you know how to do long-term enrollment projections? These are administrative skills that you're going to be looking to your head of school to help you with in terms of your professional development and learning how to do these things that you haven't had to do before. Third, you have to redefine yourself. Um, you went from being a middle management person now to being a senior management person. What does that mean to the faculty? What does that mean to the other senior managers? They've all got a working relationship amongst themselves, and now you're 
joining onto that team for the first time, and they need to see you in that different light. And probably most importantly, you need to redefine yourself within your office. Um, you're no longer everyone's buddy and best friend and the person you go out with on every Saturday night. Um, you're no longer the person that behind closed doors that you complain to each other about the boss because now you are the boss. Um, and it's not appropriate and not for you to complain to them. They're looking to you for leadership. They're not looking for you to be their colleague and their, their chief fellow complainer. Um, so you've got to redefine yourself within the office. They're used to seeing you in a certain way, and now you have a different role and you have to be seen in a different way. And this can be even more tricky if you're a, uh, an alumnus or alumna of the school um, because there's going to be a lot of faculty who are around who remember you as a student, and now suddenly you're a senior administrator. So you've got to work on rebuilding and redefining those relationships with all those different constituencies. And as I said before, you need to look at the areas where you have a lack of training for this job. Um, anyone who's a director of admissions will tell you um, there are a lot of things you wish you knew that you didn't know when you went into it, which is part of the uh, impetus to this webinar. Um, there's lots of things that you're not going to be ready for, but you need to be aware of what you're not ready for, and you need to seek the opportunities for some professional development and training for those areas. And then the second way to get into the role is to be someone who gets promoted um, or who gets hired from the outside to come into the school and the office for the first time. And that was me. Obviously, as I was um, coming from Blue Ridge and into St. James, I was the new guy on the block. And um, I, I really needed to take some uh, mindful and purposeful steps in order to kind of establish myself here as somebody that was was good for the school um, and the first thing I did is I, I really made sure that I learned the ethos of the school um, and, I, and I learned what was essential what was important um, what was preferred what was prohibited I mean everything uh, you, you really need to know the major points of the school um, you know, part of it is you, know, you need to know as the director of admissions you need to know what to do say and promote uh, to prospective students, um, but you're also kind of promoting yourself within the school community. And um, you know, if a uh, faculty meeting is a, a sacred thing where you do not bring uh, your computer in to uh, maybe check email halfway through the faculty meeting, um, you know, it's important to know that, and it's important to learn that lesson very, very quickly, and hopefully not in a, in a difficult, difficult way. Um, you also really have to build credibility. Um, you know, when I was thinking about this issue, this issue and, and this topic, um, kind of a, an image popped into my head that you know this is that that 13 or 14 year old uh, at Thanksgiving that's been promoted from the kids' table to the adult table, and uh, you really kind of have to prove that you belong there, and you have to uh, hold your own in the uh, the family conversation and banner and you have to give as good as you can get, and you have to uh, you know, bring some interesting uh, points of view to the, uh, to the table. Um, and similar to that is you have to do the same thing uh, within the administrative team and within faculty meetings, and you have to go in prepared. Um, you have to offer educated opinions uh, that, that are based on what you know as an admissions director, what you know as a person, what you know as an educator. Um, and then really most importantly, the, the most important thing you can do to build credibility is to get the job done and, and uh, hit your numbers and, and bring in awesome kids that have uh, crazy talent and um, you know, make the school a better place. And you know, the more consistently you do that, that over, uh, over your time at a given school, um, you know, the more seriously people are going to take you and, and, and listen to your opinion. Uh, but you definitely have to, have to build that up. Um, you know, another important thing that you have to do as a new guy is know where all the landmines are. Um, I think everybody probably uh, understands this, but uh, boarding schools have uh, a lot of interesting characters working there, and these interesting characters all have th things that are um, either uh, big passions or touchy subjects or uh, major issues. Um, and so you, you need to know where those landmines are. Um, you can't let yourself and uh, the programs and the, the different projects that you're trying to promote uh, get derailed by creating an unexpected mess for yourself. Um, it's actually something that I did uh, very early in my time here. I wanted to make 
a relatively minor change that would uh, make my job and the admissions uh, office job much, much easier and um, it, it made so much sense for us. And it would mean a slight change for some other offices, nothing bad or nothing difficult or uh, nothing that would really change their quality of life or work, but it was a change. And um, a lot of folks that have, have worked at St. James for a long time didn't like that and uh, kind of unbeknownst to me, uh, basically staged a minor uprising and uh, came after me with pitchforks and, and flame and torches and things. And, uh, you know, we, we had to have a meeting about it and calm everybody down and, um, you know, basically kind of unexplode the landmine, which was, which was a little bit tricky and it took a ton more time than I ever wanted or certainly intended. Um, you know, in, with that in mind, it's uh, very important that you have a mentor. Um, you know, and, and that mentor needs to be, is probably a pretty special person on campus because it has to be somebody um, that's a member of the administrative team. So uh, like Andrew was saying, you can't, um, you can't vent or you can't question people necessarily that are uh, too far above or, or below you on the organizational pyramid. Um, so you want kind of that, that same level uh, as your mentor and someone that you really trust because you need to um, ask a lot of honest questions and get some honest answers. Um, and you also have to be able to vent and let go and uh, get some things off of your chest. Um, you know, I, fortunately, I have, I have that person. Um, I should have talked to him before I stepped on that landmine, uh, but again, I didn't know it was there, so I didn't even know to ask the question uh, of my mentor. And then the, uh, the last thing that a new guy can do um, it really should have been the first thing listed here because it's, it's easily the most important. Um, and it's something that admissions folks do really, really well because it's really the nature of our business uh, to develop relationships. And you know, primarily as an admissions director, you're developing relationships with prospective students and their families and school placement uh, folks and uh, educational consultants and, and you know anyone and everyone under the sun. Um, but you know, on a boarding school campus, and it's something that I realized uh, a little belatedly uh, once I got to Blue Ridge, um, I spent seven years uh, on the academic side of things, and uh, to me, admissions was this uh, mysterious and shadowy profession. Um, and, you know, I, I didn't really know what admissions folks did, and I, and I can guarantee you that the folks uh, that you eat uh, eat with at, at dinner time or, or work next to or sit next to in chapel, um, they don't know what admissions folks do. Uh, they don't know how we go about it. They don't know the pressures we face. Um, you know, really to them, you know, we're just the, uh, <laughs> the, the employees. They get to travel a lot. Uh, we get to have some nice, uh, you know, fast food meals on the school's dime. Um, we get to you know, spend our days just chatting with people and uh, answering questions and making them feel good. Um, you know, and you know, sometimes in some boarding schools, you know, uh, the, the, the folks that travel around a lot and do a lot of external work you know, don't have as much to do with the, with the students uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Maybe they don't coach quite as many sports or they don't have as many uh, nights on dorm duty or they don't live in the dorm or don't have weekend duty or things like that. And so to uh, a lot of faculty and staff members, it, it, admissions folks have it really easy. Um, and, and with that can always, you know, come some little bit of resentment or a little bit of, you know, just not knowing. Um, so it's important to spend some extra time really getting to know the school community. Um, of course, the administration, you're going to get to spend a lot of time with them in meetings and, and, and stuff over the years. But, you know, certainly uh, faculty members, um, you know, you, you want to get to know the teachers. You, uh, the better you know them, the more likely they are to, uh, you know, welcome families uh, into their room and uh, sit down for a, uh, you know, a little uh, classroom observation uh, during the school day, maybe unannounced, and they'll just roll with the flow because they know you're a good guy or a great gal, and uh, they're willing to do that for you. Also really important to know the staff. Um, you know, know who the gatekeepers are uh, uh, around campus. Uh, typically, those are uh, the staff members. They're, they really are, are the keys to getting things done, and sometimes getting things done in a very timely manner. Um, if there's a uh, a time emergency and, you, and, and you're in a real hurry, um, 
but another thing that I'm always mindful of, I, I do my very best not to make those favors always going one way. I don't. I, I try not to always ask for favors, and, and I do my very best to uh, do a lot of favors for people and go out of my way to help folks. So that you know, the more that uh, you know, re regular folks around campus and you know the teachers and everyone will, will see that the director of admissions is willing to roll up his or her sleeves and, and help out and get things done, the more likely they are to, uh, to help you out uh, when it's crunch time. And then, um, you know, really kind of the, the crux of everything is the, the better that you know the school and the better that you know the people that work there and the, and the students that attend there, uh, the better job you're going to do in selling that school. And uh, at the end of the day, that's uh, the name of the game. And we uh, need to make you know, that knowledge that we have about the school and the people that make up the community, we need to make that knowledge into a very palpable reality uh, for those uh, prospective families. Um, so in, in doing that, you end up doing your job and you, you hit your numbers and you build the credibility that you need uh, to be taken seriously as a director of admissions. All right, and with that, well, not, not that all questions go into the trash can, but that seemed like a fitting place to ask. <laughs> we'll turn it back over to you, Karen. Okay, thanks, gentlemen. That was uh, that was an excellent presentation. Uh, I want to encourage everybody. You have Andrew and Ben live on the line right now, so if you have any questions, I would encourage you to type them into the uh, into the text box in your GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, and you can get your, your question answered in real time. Um, I do have a question here. Uh, I only have a two-person team, one of them being me. I do all interviews over 150 from December to February. Is there a better way to use my time? Um, I think one, one of the questions you should be asked, this person should be asking themselves or asking, asking their head of school is what are their expectations for their role, um, if, if their school is in a in a healthy place and what they really need to be doing is screening and looking for the best applicants, um, then maybe that that is the time. That's how their head wants them to spend their time. But if they're being asked to grow market share, think strategically, um, do projections for enrollment, do research on de demographics, um, then it may be a conversation they need to have with their head about how are we going to manage the interviews. And maybe there's opportunities for parent volunteers to be involved in in the process, maybe not interviewing, but giving tours. Um, there are certainly some schools, St. Mark's in Massachusetts being one of them, uh, where faculty get involved um, in the admissions process and do interviews. So I think the, the first question is to ask is, what, what are my primary responsibilities? What are my deliverables and my expectations as director of admissions at this small, small office? Um, and if they're more than just screening and delivering kids, then um, I think it's important to have a conversation with the head of school about, you know, the personnel needed to execute all the things that are expected of the office. Well Excellent. said. I have nothing to add to that. That's perfect. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Matt is asking, um, he's talking about the boarding school, basically the triple threat. Uh, all the admissions team members tend to have other hats. How can the director protect the time that admission needs um, with regards to the admission office's teaching, coaching, and residential life responsibilities? Well, I think that's an important role of the director of admissions is to uh, shield the rest of the team from some of those responsibilities um, while still allowing them to be a fully invested member of the community. Um, so those are discussions that I have with um, the headmaster, certainly, but also bringing in you know, whomever on, on the administrative team is in charge of that particular area. So if it's uh, weekend duty or evening dorm duty or um, living in the dorms or, or whatever the, the certain situation is, um, you know, I have that conversation with that administrative person directly um, and just ex really just explain to them you know why it is that uh, that admissions folks have a hard time managing all of that. Um, and again, like I said before during the presentation, you know, folks that are on campus all the time and you know have their um, kind of their uh, 
working lives centered around the students and working on the bell system and you know, uh, you know have, having that nine or ten month job, uh, a lot of times they, they really just don't know or they, or they know but they don't really fully comprehend. Um, and, and it's not that uh, they're trying to just load up on the admissions team, um, it's really that they don't know. And so a little education goes a long way too. I, th I think Ben's you know, completely correct there, and I think it also goes back to what is the health of the admissions operation. I worked at a previous school where almost everyone on my admissions staff when I got there had coaching responsibilities, but it was also a school that was still scrambling to find those last five kids as we went into the middle of August. And basically my, my conversation with the athletic director and the head of school was, you know, where are our priorities? You know, what, what's more important that we not hire, you know, an outside coach for $2,000 for a term to run ultimate Frisbee um, and thereby keep this admission staff person in the admissions office until, you know, 5 o'clock every day? Or is it more important that they be out there coaching ultimate Frisbee and we're taking our eye off the ball in terms of our resources in the admissions office? There's, as Ben pointed out, there's lots of ways to be involved in the school, and I think that's really important. But there's lots of ways to be involved that don't have responsibility with them. You know, you can... Mm -hmm coach as you can, but you're not someone that the team depends on that has to ride the bus to the away game. Um, you know, you can help out with the drama program, you know, as you can. You can do duty when you're, you know, off the road, but not to be part of the regular duty team. So there's ways to balance the triple threat. But I think if an admissions office is being pulled in different directions, the question that has to be asked is what's, which is the most important direction for the institution? Where do we want to put these resources? Excellent. Thank you. Um, Diane is saying, we, we are also a two-person office, and I'm the former associate director and now the director. Her challenge is phone calls, follow-up calls, questions, etc. Do you set aside specific time each day for calls, and any recommendations on how to manage that? Um, it, I, I'm str I struggle with phone calls, too. To be uh, <laughs> to be perfectly honest, um, but it, it's something that I don't set aside a time, a particular time during the day. Um, if a prospective family is calling um, and I have a chance to talk to them on the phone, um, I find that much more uh, a much better return on my investment to to answer the phone call uh, than it is to try and hunt the family down with emails and, and mailings and things to to get them on the phone in the first place. Um, the way to manage that, that that's a good question. I, I try and route um, most of my initial phone calls into the admissions office through my office manager. Um, and so she can you know, kind of pick some of the low-hanging fruit and you know, schedule visits and um, answer some of the real basic questions. Um, but if you know, it's someone that really wants to talk to one of the um, admission team members or has some hard questions or wants to talk about a particular subject, then they get forwarded on to that person. So we have a little bit of a tree, um, but the, uh, there's a lot of branch jumping in that tree too and people uh, will bypass the office manager and go straight to me or one of my other uh, associates. Okay, Andrew, thank you. Do you have any tips for us? No, I've got people in my office. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> uh, Jenna is asking, uh, is marketing and communications uh, part of the admission offices in your schools, or is that a separate function? Oh, that's one of my favorite topics. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, at, at, at Ridley, it is, it, it is in the admissions office. It was uh, formerly in the development office, which I think is where it traditionally sits in, in many schools. Um, but we had a pretty practical, business-minded board that finally got around to asking itself the question, if we want a million dollars in additional revenue next year, um, you know, that could be you know, five additional or 20 additional boarding students. Um, or that could be how long does that take for the development office to raise a million dollars and realizing that if we get more students, those students will pay tuition year after year after year. So we moved marketing and communications over to the admissions office because we realized that if we wanted more revenue, the faster, easier route, relatively speaking, not fast and easy, but faster and easier, 
um, then fundraising was actually putting more bodies into beds. And so the decision was to move those resources into the world of admissions where they could be employed to do more immediate, um, have a more immediate impact on the bottom line. And at St. James, we have a similar understanding with a slightly different structure. Um, our communications director who um, handles all of the communications and, and does a lot of the marketing um, is kind of an independent body and a, and a member of the administrative team uh, that answers to the headmaster as a, as a direct report. So um, she is basically ha has one foot in the admissions world and one foot in the uh, development world and you know, works with both offices to uh, do the external affairs and the, and the messaging for the school. Um, so it's really Overall, the, the marketing and communications is um, a three-headed monster with our communications being the, uh, the most important and main head. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. Um, I'd like to, rec uh, I'd like to just let everybody know we're, we're at the end of our questions at this point, and we've only gone four minutes over, so we're, we're doing really well. Uh, I'd, I'd like to let everybody know that this uh, presentation is being recorded and will be available on SSAT.org, um, or I'm sorry, admission.org. Uh, gentlemen, if you'd like to uh, sign off, I will do my exit as well. Great. Well, Lindsay, thanks, everyone. Uh, ben, great to be working with you, and, and best wishes to everyone in their admissions uh, cycle this year. Happy New yeah. Year. Yep, and I'd like to echo uh, that sentiment, and uh, thank you, Andrew, and everybody for being here. Um, good luck, and uh, stay, stay warm these next couple of days. I think everybody's pretty chilly right now. <laughs> Absolutely. I want to thank our audience for tuning in, and a special thank you to Andrew and Benjamin for providing us with this insightful webinar. Uh, once again, a recording of this presentation will be made available on the webinar page in the professional development section on admission.org. Thanks again, and have a wonderful day and a prosperous admission season.